Welcome to The Truth in Us Art. I am your host, Rob Lee, and I'm excited, over the moon, thrilled, some might say, to welcome my next guest, a creative director, designer, documentary photographer. Please welcome Brady Robinson. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for making the time. And, um, you know, as we kind of delve in, in, into the, the the beginning of this podcast, uh, you know, I want to give you the space. Uh, can you give us a little background and really how did you get started in photography, creative direction? Tell us a bit about that. Well, my background is in documentary photography and portraiture. And I started out really young. My mom gave me a camera when I was growing up. And we used to take drives in the Virginia countryside and take photos together. And in high school, I actually got a job with the Winchester Star, which is the local newspaper where I grew up. And I started working as a stringer at a, like a small newspaper in Northern Virginia. So I got my start really early. And um, the beginning part of my career was really focused on um, teaching full time and going into academia. So I went to MICA for my undergraduate degree, the BFA in photography. And then I did two years at the Anderson Ranch Art Center in Snowmass Village, Colorado, as an artist in residence, and then my MFA from Cranbrook Academy of Art. So um, the first part of my career was dedicated to teaching. My background is in teaching, fine art photography, and commercial photography. And it really wasn't until I moved to Baltimore that I had this incredible opportunity to explore many paths in photography. Yeah. And I launched a commercial practice along with my fine artwork. So really in Baltimore, I was able to um, start creative direction, meaning really having creative control over the entire photo shoot from the idea to the execution. And there's a lot of time and energy that goes into creative direction. Um, days can be spent preparing for a shoot, conceptualizing the shoot. <laughs> And in Baltimore, I divide my time between my fine art, commission work, and teaching photography. I also do a lot of work for Be More Art. I'm a contributing photographer. And for Be More Art, I cover art, culture, and the culinary landscape. And it's been wonderful to explore um, just the arts in Baltimore. Baltimore is such a rich place for um, raw energy and, and creativity. A lot of times in my shoot, I will cast artists as models. Yeah. Um, we've done this entire series showcasing Baltimore designers. So a lot of time goes into location scouting, casting artists, and just as a way to um, shine a light on the creativity in Baltimore. Yeah. Um, I also teach part-time prior to coming to Baltimore. I held a um, tenured position. I was the director of the MFA in Studio Art and the Computer Program at the University of Central Florida. So I did a real pivot from um, academia into um, the real world. <laughs> and I'm grateful to Baltimore. Yeah. Baltimore is my art home. And I never thought I would be back, but is a great place to be an artist and a photographer. And I think Baltimore um, supports artists in a lot of ways that other places can't. Thank you. I think that that's great. And, you know, that's, you know, really a big portion of what this podcast has been about and what it continues to be about is kind of shining a light on all of these creatives that are here that, you know, may not fit that sort of typical mold. It's like they may even question at times, am I an artist? And I'm like, oh, are you? Let's let's talk about it. And it's it's really fun. And it's so many and I always, you know, remark upon just the the sort of beginning, the the planning stages of doing this, you know, trying to get those early episodes and like talking to my 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 friends and, and and folks that have marketing backgrounds. I'm like, does this have legs? And I just remember one telling me like, I'd be surprised if you could find 20 interesting people that are creatives. And you know, now I'm in like 600 interviews in that sort of trajectory right now, and probably about 80 to 90 percent are Baltimore based. So mm -hmm. it's like really cool, and I definitely see what you're describing. It's like it's a lot of creatives here, and I think really accessible from you know people doing visual arts to photographers to a lot of different things, and a really cool DIY scene and music and so on. 
Well, I feel that Baltimore is a place where you can create the life you want to live, mm. a sustainable life. Yeah. And I, and I find like, you know, definitely the, the sort of pivot, um, I am in this sort of like hybrid life right now, part time in academia, but on the data side of it and um, doing and doing this, you know, pretty much full time. I was a marketing analyst before I got into academia, <laughs> probably about 10 years ago. And that was a whole different lifestyle, like just just running yourself ragged. Uh, it's like, huh? Real world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, as far as the, you know, like sort of commercial work that you're doing and creative direction that you're doing, could you describe a bit of your creative process? Um, like, what is it like? What is usually the starting point, you know, and and when do you know, like, all right, you know, outside of like getting the shots. But when do you know that you're like satisfied and you're finished, you're done with uh, this sort of portion of the work? Well, in my commercial practice, a lot of my clients are creatives and small business owners. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of female entrepreneurs. So there's a lot of planning that goes involved in one of those shoots. Yeah. And in my fine art practice, it's always been pretty organic and intuitive. Yeah. I've always used my camera to document my life, my friends and my surroundings. So often um, as I'm just using the camera to move through the world, I'll have like an aha moment. Or a happy accident. So, for example, with Skater Girls, which I know we're going to talk about later, um, a, a lot of it is just there's a, a very little line or division between art and life. For me, they're both in the same. My life is my art and my art is my life. Yeah. It's just a very intuitive and organic place. I trust process too. Mm -hmm. You know, I try not to overthink it. I feel that you have to allow your work to speak for itself. So you, you create and you learn and you get feedback just by doing the work. It's that simple. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, you know, you, you do whatever the thing is you're doing and, you know, whether it's something like this for sake of argument, you know, I go in with certain intent and, and I'll say like, when I'm trying to do an interview, I'm, I'll reach out to the person and I don't really talk to them too much until I get to lead time for the interview because I don't want to feel like we've already given away the good stuff, you know, before we actually get to the, the conversation. And, you know, I'll hear from folks. They'll say, man, that was a really cool interview with this person. I didn't know that about them and so on. I'm like, cool. Yeah, I have to just kind of take it for what it is and, you know, what my focus is and what I'm doing. I definitely relate to sort of, you know, kind of the work speaking for itself. And there's a lot of time and preparation that goes into that. You just mm -hmm. don't like show up and wing it. I mean, this is years of education and study and discipline and practice and a lot of failures and some wins. And you got to take the wins when you get them. And I don't get any wins. What are you talking about? <laughs> no, but I, you're right. You're right. Um, definitely taking taking the wins. And I, I want to get a sense on, you know, sort of tweaking. Um, I, I'll say recently I've, I've tweaked how I go about doing this a little bit. Um, and one part of that tweaking process, tweaking of the process, if you will, didn't really work. So I was like, all right, take that out, move on to something else and see how can I maybe streamline this or how can I get to the good stuff? You know, like, um, I, this is the good stuff for me, the stuff after the sort of post-production stuff or the stuff leading up to it. And it's like, eh, it's, it's fine. But getting to the actual conversation is the, the sort of highlight of this sort of full workflow. Um, so how in, in what points do you like tweak like the general sort of process of what you're doing well with preparation there's a uh, production and i try to get into a flow state okay. and if something fails you always have to have a backup plan and you have to be willing just to go for it and you got to be committed and you got to be ready so in terms of tweaking your process um, for, for me, photography is a dance, especially during portraiture. So my goal is to make my subject look the best version of them. And I think there's a lot of power in portraiture because you're holding space for another person and everyone deserves to be seen. Yeah. 
And in my fine art practice, especially with skater girls, um, I love, uh, my work has a lot of energy and I love photographing motion. So I just have to like get into a flow state and go for it. And you have these aha moments. You're like, I, I feel a good image. When I'm working and I, I release the shutter, I'm like, yeah, that's a good one. That's a money shot. I feel it. And it's really frustrating when uh, you don't get that immediately. But I think that's when a lot of planning and preparation go into a shoot. You've got to get the light right. After I get the light right, I'm like, okay, it's go time. And music's also very important to me. So oh. always if I'm in the studio on set, I play music so that helps sets the vibe and gets the energy going. So it's, it's funny, like w what you were mentioning there touches on two of these next questions. So I might as well get to them. Okay. Uh, what what are the qualities? And, and I know it's a little bit of a feeling you were like, you know, you know, when you got it, you got it. But what separates a good image from a great image? Good light, great timing. I thought about this for a little bit because I know it was like on our radar. Um, oh, say, I'm going to say good lighting, great timing and happy accidents. So for me, it's when you release that shutter, everything comes together in the world in a split second of time. So I love sort of, I, I love um, Cartier-Bresson who coined the term, the decisive moment. Mm -hmm. So for Cartier-Bresson, who was a street photographer in the thirties and forties in Paris and all over France, for him, when you release the shutter, that's when everything comes together and it just works. And for me, um, timing is everything. I also love visual juxtapositions and, you know, the meaning that happens when you compare two unlike things. So within a split second of time, you can have all these images colliding very quickly and then frozen in a moment of time that it's not till later that, okay, here's your subject and here's the thing, the thing itself. But through metaphor, yeah. you know, it can become other, another thing. So that's like the second half, act in photography. For me, I love the act of photography itself, but it's the second act that gives meaning to the words, uh, not the words, but it gives meaning to the photograph, like visual juxtaposition, an energy. Composition is everything. Mm -hmm. I photograph full frame. I never crop my photos. If someone crops my photos, I get really upset. So sometimes it's in my contract. Like these photos are not to be altered, cropped, or manipulated in any manner. <laughs> I'm also old school that way. You know, yeah. even when I shot film, I always shoot full frame. I don't crop. And often, too, I, I think you got to get really close to your subject. You got to get in there and get really close. So, I think the physical proximity of the camera to the subject or the event or whatever is going on, yeah. you have more of a, a feeling when you get close. That one, I, I, I got a comment on one thing that, that made me uh, really think about um, a chef for a moment. It was like, it's in my contract. Like, essentially, when a chef is <laughs> like, hey, this is prepared the way it was supposed to be. So we don't need ketchup on the fries. Uh -huh. It's properly seasoned. Let's not add anything else to uh -huh. it. And Though on the other side of it, I remember the one, uh, I've, I've done a few photo shoots, but one that was kind of like, I'm providing, I guess, the direction for it. Um, and I just remember, you know, working with these like young photographers and they're definitely just in there. I was like, yo, this is invasive. But the shots came out so great. It was, it was really cool. And I was like, oh, this is this was great. And this was something that I kind of thought and we collaborated and it worked out. Um, but yeah, definitely. I was like, this is a bit invasive. You're in my nose. This is a lot. <laughs> well, I also, I, I have permission, you know, before you know, there's permission and trust. I think trust is really important when you're photographing anyone. Yeah, absolutely. So we're about a year removed from uh skater girls. Let's uh, describe it for the listeners. And, yeah. um, I got a few other questions in there, but at least start off right there. Okay. Well, during the pandemic in the spring of 2021, I took up roller skating as a means of movement and fitness and just to connect with my friends. 
during uh, isolation in the pandemic. And I started having these skate dates where, and I would go and photo, roller skate with my friends. And I started bringing my camera to photograph these skate dates and it became a photo series. It just became very organic and one shoot will lead to the other. And the work really reflects my, vow, my, my love of athleticism, fitness and fashion photography. And at the end of the day, it was my goal to really represent strong women, but at the same time, highlight the beauty of Baltimore as a backdrop. Yeah. So the majority of these photo, photos uh, were made at Hallmark locations in Baltimore. I went to the Ravens lot, Lake Montebello, Fort McHenry, Patterson Park, Clifton Park, Druid Park tennis courts. I was, I was all over Baltimore. So it was sort of twofold, highlighting the strength of women, but also highlighting the beauty of the back, Baltimore backdrop. And the work really um, is a reflection of my values. I value fitness. I value wellness. I value female empowerment and agency. And I also value creativity and fierce individuality, which is Baltimore. Yeah. And there was a wide range of women too. And the majority of my subjects were all artists. I photographed musicians, dancers, photographers, small business owners. So it also highlighted um, some small business owners, also an artist in the creative scene in Baltimore. Yeah. And the work was on exhibition last spring with Maryland Art Place at Hotel Indigo in Baltimore. And um, I have a series that's kind of like an extension of skater, skater Girls. I've been photographing skaters in my studio and I'm high, trying to create the vibes of an 80s roller rink. And I'm shooting them on a dark backdrop, but I'm lighting it with gels and just trying to insert a lot of energy um, in a tight space yeah. and in a tight frame. That's and recently one of uh, this, the new iteration was on exhibition at Addison Ripley Fine Art. They represent my work in DC. And um, it was also part of an NFT and a photo show through Addison Ripley. So that's sort of a, the long story, but um, your girls is still in my heart. Thank you. That's that's uh, really really cool to have you and, and going back and you know doing the research and looking at the the images that are there and just yeah, I, I was just like, oh, it's been a year. That was literally the first thing that I thought, and I was like, this was I felt like this was last week. This was so cool, know, right? <laughs> and I was very fortunate to have a, a lot of support. Um, LED Baltimore posted uh, published the work on the LED Baltimore near Penn Station. Yeah. And um, it was Visit Baltimore. I advertised the show on all the kiosks in the city. So really it cool. never gets old seeing your work on a billboard. <laughs> this is true. This is true. I've been on that LED board a couple of times. And I, I remember once where my dad was like, I, I was with my dad. He was driving. He literally stopped. He's like, is that you on that board? Hold on for a second. And I was like, yeah, you know, it's me. So yeah, it's definitely really cool to see your work um like blown up and to that degree and just, you know, also even getting the support and, you know, just sort of that acknowledgement because at the end of the day, you know, I think we're putting out whatever work we're putting out, you know, and if someone is like I want to support it, I want to, you know, put my time towards, put my effort and resources, that's mm -hmm. just the, that's gravy. Rich rich delicious gravy, but gravy nonetheless. And on the cake, man, you know. <laughs> I see on the cake. 100% Mm -hmm. So was there was there any like great interesting it's not not tea per se but great really interesting stories that came out of like the the process of putting together uh, skater girls? I I was um, let me think about this. Yeah, well, we had a really fun skate party as an after party at Maryland Art Place. Yeah. So I'm very interested in this idea of like social experiments as an art form. So I love this idea of bringing everyone from different backgrounds together and skating in an art space. So um, the after party was uh, a lot of fun at Maryland Art Place. I had a lot of people in roller skates and art, my two loves. That's great. 
I like when it can carry to sort of another sort of thing and be reimagined, um, whatever the thing is we're doing. Um, so one of the things that I'm looking at doing, uh, taking maybe a little bit of a cue from you, a little, just, a, just a little bit. Uh, I, I want to do this, this podcast idea called podcasting in place, where it's literally this sort of thing, the thing that I do, but done in one of these historic landmarks. So highlighting the landmark, whether it be a museum, whether it be sort of a social gathering place and doing the interview there, but also capturing B roll of the venue. Cause I know that a lot of places since the pandemic, that experience has changed a lot. So almost like, hey, let's just, hey, remember this place? It looks really cool. Here's something new there. And we're doing this cool interview. So I think kind of reimagining how we do some of this stuff and put it in a sort of different uh, capacity kind of brings renewed interest, maybe. And you have to be open and willing to make that kind of pivot. And also for me, if I'm if I'm a little scared of something, if there's like a, a certain amount of fear, I'm like, oh, I got to do it now. I'm scared. I have to do this. It got a response out of you. It's like, ah, ah I felt that. I got to do something about it. Um, I I had a had a conversation uh, earlier in this week um, just with someone I'm going to potentially um, do an interview with and we've collaborated in the past. And uh, they saw a video that I did for this, um, this class project um, earlier this year. And the video was about stage fright. Mm-hmm. And I, it was a very, it was a learning opportunity for me, just that whole experience of, I overrode this. I was able to get past it and do the thing, but I felt something. I was like, I need to really capture that moment and recognize it and kind of use it. So, hey, do this thing that you may not be comfortable or may have fear towards doing. You're still going to do it. So go ahead and go ahead and do it. Tap back into that sort of feeling and really understand it and process it. And that's authentic. And I think if you're willing to um, be vulnerable and be real, you have more authentic conversation with um, viewers yeah. and listeners. So how often, and this, this kind of definitely is a segue, I suppose, how often are you exploring like sort of other genres, other mediums, what have you, and what sparks like your interest to maybe approach another creative undertaking? Like, like what, what was that sort of starting point for you? I love learning. And I'm always going down a rabbit hole, learning new things. Um, that happens a lot in the classroom when I'm teaching part-time, yeah. but it also happens in the studio with experimenting with new lighting techniques, new setups. Hey, yeah. I'm always exploring and learning. You gotta, you gotta have those um those, those points where you're like, all right, what can I do here? Let's let's figure that out. Then suddenly it's like, yes, this new special Brady technique here that <laughs> it's hard to put words around it. You know, it's such a a visual process. And often when I am in the middle of a photo shoot, I am focused, so hyper-focused on all the visuals. Sometimes I lose my language ability. I was on a shoot the other day and I'm like, oh my God, like the words are not coming. (laughs) That's that's really funny, actually. I've, um, I've had that, I've had that before where um, like if I'm working with someone, I'm trying to do more like events and programming things of the sort. And if someone's like, Hey, I'll give you a hand or have you, can you describe exactly what you need? I was like, you know, the thing, just, you know, you got it, you know what it is. And, and like, you're not making any sense. I was like, I'm sorry. I just don't have it right now. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> do the thing. You got it. <laughs> so I think, you know, some, some people like do take a walk. Some people go for a drive, um, just to do something unrelated to that work that kind of helps them, you know, to get to that next stage within their work. I think inevitably when we get stuck, we have to disengage in some way. How do you go about disengaging? And what is a a recent example of like you disengaging to kind of get you to that sort of next stage when you're stuck in a, in your process? For me, movement is medicine. I do hot yoga and yoga is a way where you, you kind of fight your dragons on the mat. And it's also a good discipline. I also swim. I've been swimming this winter. I swim laps. And for me, um, swimming is a way to quiet my mind. And um, it's sort of a combination of of a lot of movement. I also cycle a lot. My partner and I bike all through the city, especially in the summer, but on the weekends and when it stays light out longer. So I think for me, um, fitness helps a lot being active, moving, moving through space and time. 
I'm usually just just grunting through the through the fitness. I've been uh you know definitely in the last couple of years just in the gym, heavy weights, doing all of that stuff. And I'm like, huh, I, I I would wish that I would have some illumination for like, oh, I could do something creative here. Let me take this note down. No, no, no. It's just like you don't want to drop this weight on your foot, fool. So <laughs> really pay attention. Um, but I will say during the cardio portion, I, I might, you know, have a because I'm usually listening to audiobooks. I might have an illumination then. But um, yeah, I, you know, I think when when I get stuck, movement Nick makes a lot of sense, like going for a walk. I love walks. I, I used to live near Patterson Park and I would I walk a lot in Patterson Park. Yeah, I'm not far from Patterson Park. So what my move would be, I would walk over from lovely East Baltimore and take that stroll over there. And then I realized I was like, oh, I've gone past pie time. I'm in a completely different area now. <laughs> yeah, it switches really quick. Yes. And um, and also I find like I remember I went on this this walk when I was in um in Austin, Texas um last summer. And you know, I was coming up with questions for a guest, and it's like I felt like I was short one question. And I and I hate that feeling. Like I don't want to feel like I'm padding. I was like, I'd rather have seven to eight decent questions. And then from there, it's like if one runs long, cool, but I'd rather not have like like too little. And you know, I was walking and I saw a bumper sticker that was like, art is the new magic. And I was like, that's, that's, that's inspiration. That's a question. Write it down. That's beautiful. <laughs> yes. So I got one last question and then I got those rapid fire questions. Um, the last one is, is, is a little shameless pluggy, but you know, what projects um, are you pursuing in the future? What, what do you got coming up? Look out world. Skater girls is going global. I am in the process of seeking funding and writing a grant to go to Morocco. There's a whole movement of women starting to skate in Morocco. I have a friend that's building a skate park hotel in Tagazout, which is about an hour outside of Agadir. And I'm going to go to Morocco and photograph women who skate. So taking the show on the road. That's great. Going to Morocco. Going to manifest Morocco somehow, some way. But it's on deck. And I'm also interested in starting another project, but this time really photographing uh, artists and their wellness routine. Yeah. Like a lot of artists I know, um, well, I'll give you an example. My friend, Jill Shannon, uh, Jill Fannin, she's uh, into CrossFit right now. Um, I have a lot of friends into yoga, some artist friends who walk a lot. So I could see that um, on deck. And as soon as it gets warm, I'm going on more photo walks and I would like to do more street portraits for the people of Baltimore. I love it. Love it. Love I always it. have a lot of sticks in the fire, Rob. That's probably um, both a, a gift and a weakness. I, But I also love photography. So I've been able to go on this incredible journey to explore a lot of avenues. And the cam my camera has also been a passport. I mean, like I've traveled and exhibited work and I, I've been able to live abroad, teach abroad. So I'm very grateful for the journey that it's provided. That's great. I don't take anything for granted. That's that's a that's a great quotable though. Like the camera's like a passport. I, I don't, I'm gonna steal that. I'm stealing. Just letting you know. I'm, I'm gonna I'll credit you because I, you know, I don't I don't want to crop what you said, nor do I want to crop any of your pictures. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I will credit you. <laughs> um so let's let's move into the the rapid fire portion of the podcast. Okay. Um, you know, I feel like uh, Dokin is playing into the fire. Maybe I don't know. That's uh -huh. every now and again I have a reference. Um, the first one, first question, and you know, don't overthink these. It's you know, uh, sometimes people get caught. I'm like, what's your favorite movie? <sighs> well, hmm, if I get down in here, so here's the question. Okay. What is what is your motto like with whether it comes to photography, whether it comes to like how you approach life? What is your motto? Choose happy. Um, name the just what's the first word that comes to your mind when I say the word creativity? Fierce. W uh, where do you feel most in, um, inspired? Life. Let's see. If you, if your life was made into a story, it could be movie, book, what have you, what would it be titled? Oh boy. The title? She had fun. 
<laughs> and let's see. Um, and just just because I'm really interested, in, I'm always interested in, um, you know, sort of the self self care ish kind of thing, and um, kind of what people eat. So I'll, these will be the last two. Um, how many hours of sleep do you get? Oh, I'm very disciplined when it comes to my sleep hygiene. I used to be a night owl and have a ton of energy at night, but all that changed. And I'm um, I'm a solid 10 p.m. kind of girl. Yeah. And I don't like any distractions. I'm not going to watch the news late or like I don't want any like noise or light pollution. So 10 p.m. And then I normally get up at six or seven. I'm, I'm kind of an early bird. Yeah. I, I try to meditate in the morning. Um, I go to yoga at 7 a.m. a couple times a week. So I'm kind of an early bird now. There you go. This, this is the last one for you. Um, so let's say super busy week. You know, you're at, you're at about that sort of, let's see, you, know, you, said you, you said you go to sleep religiously, you know, at 10. Mm -hmm. So let's say it's about 8 o'clock. You're like, I need to eat something. You hate to eat something late, but you got to eat something. What is your, I need something quick. I need something good. I have limited time. What is that meal that you're making? Um, that would be apple and peanut butter. Or maybe some blueberries and almonds and a cheese stick. Okay. I like it. It could be a protein shake, but that's more of a morning thing. Yes. So th those would be my go-to. Well, that's pretty much it. I think we covered a lot here. Um so, um, one, I want to thank you for coming on to this podcast. It's been a, it's been a treat and, you know, I like the lighting there, everything in this visual thing. Um, and, uh, and secondly, I want to invite and encourage you to share, um, where folks can check you out, check out your work, social media, website, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rob. I can be found online on Instagram, Twitter, social media, just at, at E Brady Robinson. My website is ebradyrobinson.com. The E stands for Elizabeth, by the way. Fun fact, um, when I started publishing my work as a teenager, it was my mother's idea to drop the, the E. He stands for Elizabeth. She thought maybe I would have a fair shot in the world. And there you have it, folks. I want to again thank E. Brady Robinson for coming on to the podcast. And I'm Rob Lee saying that there's art and culture in and around your neck of the woods. You've just got to look for it. Oh,